Hi, my name is Jennifer Hall. I'm with the Ann Arbor Housing Commission. And I can tell by looking at this audience that you're incredible people. Because if you're going to come to a session like this on fairness and equity and sustainability, then you're the type of people that we want to be with and work with because you can't make those kind of communities work um, with just one person. You need a lot of people in your community who care about these issues. So thank you everybody for coming and anybody who ends up watching this on, uh, on the video. <laughs> so I'm going to cover um, sort of a big picture issue of affordable housing and our, our county. Uh, as well as some of the things that we're specifically doing, and then I'll try to tie it back into this uh, actual grant. Um, one of the things I get asked a lot, a lot is, what is affordable housing? Like, if, if somebody's rent, if there's a rental building and it has a unit for $700, is that affordable? Well, it's the, not the amount of rent. It depends on who's living there. And so the way that people in the affordable housing community look at affordability is if you're paying more than 30% of your income on rent, then you're, um, it's cost prohibitive for you to live there. Um, so depending on your income, 30% may be $100, it may be $2,000. So it really depends on who, what the family size is and, and what the income is. And one of the newest uh, paradigms that's talked about in the planning world, and you've heard uh, it's spoken about now with um, Steve and Jamie as well, is transportation. And so when you look at affordable housing, uh, now people look at, well, is it, it's not just your housing, which would include utilities and taxes. It, it's a rental house. It could be a homeowner, either situation. But what are your transportation costs? Because when you live in high-cost communities or you work in a high-cost community uh, like Ann Arbor and you're um, looking for a lower-cost alternative, you have to move farther and farther away, which increases your transportation costs. And so those are two components, as long with, along with utilities, which gets included in the housing costs that are um, some of the biggest expenses on affordable housing. And in our community, um, we are a high-cost community, in case you didn't know that. Um, this chart shows you what the national poverty level is on the left. And on the far right is the median income for both a one-person household, which is in blue, and a four-person household, which is in red, for Washtenaw County. And a lot of programs, affordable housing programs, are based on median income. So it might be 80% or 30% or 50%. And like most of the tenants who live in our units are in that second category. They're under 30% of median or they're under the poverty level. Um, and you can see that the national median income, which is the third column, that is significantly lower than Washtenaw County's median income. And so one of the things I like to talk about, and, and HUD does too, but it's, it's an ironic policy way that I'll explain, is fair and equitable housing and deconcentration of poverty. If you look at this map, um, this is a map of poverty levels by census tract. And so you look at it and it's like, oh, okay, it's kind of evenly dispersed throughout um, the metropolitan urbanized areas. But when I try to talk about and think about um, the impact of poverty in communities, when you look at poverty levels, that doesn't really tell you the story. Uh, so I like to show what it looks like if you look at public assistance. So it's one thing um, to have a poverty level. It's a different issue if you look at how many people are on public assistance. Because if you compare the two, is there a pattern that you can see at least in the Ann Arbor area? Is there something special about Ann Arbor in that downtown area that might impact the poverty level that has nothing to do with who's on public assistance? If you're not from Ann Arbor and you look at that map, you'll notice that that's the student area. And so the, the irony for us is, is the um, lot of federal grants and formulas that come to communities, if they have poverty is one of the items that determines um, how much money is coming into your community, which a lot of the affordable housing programs are, we actually get a lot more money coming into our community because we have so many students here. And so students, when they say, what's your income, it might be $2,000. It doesn't mean you're necessarily poor, it just means you happen to be a student at U of M, they're not talking about their family's income, their family could make $200,000. And so 
when you look at census tracts and you're looking at poverty, it doesn't tell you the whole story if you're in a community um, that has a lot of students. So if you look at our community, you can see that the concentration of poverty is truly not in Ann Arbor. It's actually on the, um, it's mostly in Ypsilanti Township and Ypsilanti City. And I worked with all of these communities in my previous job, and I still get um, a lot of folks from that side of the county wondering why all the low-income people are living in their community and, and how can we help them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, HUD's policy and who we are and what we do. We are actually, the, the Ann Arbor Housing Commission is actually the largest provider of affordable housing uh, in our county. And we have um, 355 public housing units, they're all in the city. And we also manage over 1,500 vouchers that are spread throughout the county. And this is just gives you a flavor of uh, the folks that live in our, in our housing units. At the bottom, you'll see a note. We opened up our wait list to get uh, vouchers, and we did it online for the first time. We had over 15,000 applications. Um, and that's for about, we probably have, maybe if we're lucky, we'll have 100 units turn over a year. And so we had 15,000 applications for uh, 100 vouchers. And so that can, that's just an illustration of the huge demand there is for affordable housing in our community compared to what's available out there. I mean, in a perfect world, if somebody needed a $200 a unit rent, there would be, if let's say there's 1,000 people that needed that, you'd have 1,000 units that are at $200 rent. But that isn't what happens. There aren't any units out there like that unless you have a subsidy. And people can move wherever they want. So there may be people in this room who can afford $1,000 a month in rent, but they only pay 700 because that's all they feel like they want to pay or need to pay. And so that's displacing someone who needs a $700 rent because there's so few at the, at the lowest end. I mean, we all should be able to live in a place that, that we can actually afford. Unfortunately, um, the funding that is there for affordable housing is unbelievably shrinking. Um, back in, <laughs> I just noticed there's no date. HUD's budget is $86.8 billion. That was like 1976. Um, and here we are 40 years later, and it's half, half the amount is what it was when almost all of our public housing was built was in the uh, 1970s. And so what is the impact? Um, we manage properties, and I'm going to show you some actual uh, pictures of properties that have s had serious disinvestment because uh, we are not getting the funding from the federal government that we need to provide the housing. And we still provide it, and we still have to provide the best we can do. Oops, I forgot. I had this one first. Um, so on our voucher side, if you, we provide vouchers and HUD wants us to deconcentrate poverty and give people an opportunity to move to a place with better schools, transportation, um, better jobs, which we agree with, but HUD caps the amount we can let people, um, the amount of rent that people can live in and the units that they live in. So they don't give us unlimited resources, they gave us a very restricted amount of resources. And so if you can only find a three bedroom unit for your family and the rent has to be less than, I don't know what it is right now, let's just say $950, you aren't gonna live in Ann Arbor. You're gonna be forced to move outside of the city even though you have a, a voucher subsidy. And so this is a map showing where people actually live that have our vouchers. And again, you can see it's very much concentrated in the Ypsilanti area. Now I get to show you actual photos of our actual public housing units. Well, they, this isn't the case now because we fixed it, but this is what happens uh, when you have a disinvestment of um, funding for existing, let alone new, affordable housing. Um, this is just showing some windows that were uh, water damaged. And if you own a house or if you've lived in a rental housing unit, like water is just so bad. Like we've had probably eight pipes break this week with this cold weather, flooding basements, burning out fire panels. It's been a really, really bad week for us and very expensive and difficult for tenants. Um, simple things you can do, like we, we have to, when you don't have enough money, you let things go and you let things go so you can afford to fix them. So you end up with carpeting. It's just, I mean, you can walk on it, but who wants to live in a place that looks like that? And so we actually replaced all of our carpets in our common areas with marmoleum. 
um, which is a more energy, uh, less energy consumptive and lasts a lot longer, even though it's an upfront expensive cost. And one of the ways we involved our tenants, um, we actually had them um, vote. Like all of our tenants are the folks that you want to reach if you're doing planning stuff. And so everything we do, we're always talking to underrepresented folks for all our stuff. But one of the things we did is we had tenants actually vote on their color scheme of the type of marmoleum. And on the right is what they picked in one of our buildings. And ironically, the exact same color scheme in another building, which you wouldn't think sort of brownie, reddy, yellow would be a common choice, but that's what they chose. We also had a roof at Baker that was literally leaking down the walls through the units in a six-story building, and the DDA um, helped us put on a um, metal roof. And so a metal roof is going to last us 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years uh, as long as we maintain it, and it's going to protect the building. But it's a big investment, not one that we couldn't use with, with HUD funds. Oh, I'm actually not done. I have one more thing to say. Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> Um, so one of the things we're doing is we're completely reinvesting in all of our, our properties and we're doing it through, we've had to go out to the private sector and not using the funds from HUD. And so we're doing that as well as our component of this grant is actually to try to do a, um, what I would like to call a demonstration green affordable housing project where we actually have sort of, uh, we have on-site um, workshops and we have sort of a laboratory uh, for people to come in and actually install and see how different kinds of technologies works that are um, more cutting edge green technologies, including tenants, including people in the community, and then track it over time to see how one type of material or component or technology uh, works compared to another one. Because we own the properties, we're a public entity, we can do that. But the most critical thing um, that's important to make affordable housing work is you have to have public support and you have to have public investment. And the property that we're looking at, we're trying to get it done on a publicly owned land, a county, city, something like that, because you can't um, make the kind of projects happen if you're competing with the private sector for property. Like, we cannot compete with somebody who can just hand over millions of dollars in cash. Like, we don't have it. Um, and so that's my, my takeaway, and then my final thing is to say thank you for coming and thank you for caring about this issue. <laughs>